Excellent. Uh, well, hello all. Thank you for uh, having us here. Uh, Melissa and I are, are really excited to uh, to share with you today uh, a topic that we think fits perfectly uh, in the theme of, of good and evil, uh, dark patterns. Uh, sounds so spooky already. Um, but uh, we want to expand a little bit of this definition more than just uh, dark visual design patterns like we might be familiar with, but also expand this to the dark product patterns, the 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 patterns that the products themselves implement that can ultimately be used to potentially uh, harm users. But uh, before, before we get into that, uh, just tell you a little bit about us. Uh, as we said, uh, I'm a, a senior user experience researcher uh, at YouTube, a whole uh, long ferry ride away in Zurich. Uh, I recently moved to the area. Uh, I'm still working on my German, so thank you all for being patient. Uh, and my background is in cognitive psychology and uh, specifically training in human factor psychology, which is all about taking what we know about human cognition, memory, and attention, and applying that to safe and efficient interaction between humans, uh, machines, and, and technology. And wanted to uh, bring a little bit of that lens to dark patterns, and we'll kind of get into that uh, a little bit later in the talk. But I also wanted to give Melissa an opportunity to introduce herself, and she'll uh, take it from there. So, hello, I'm Melissa. I'm also a cognitive psychologist, and I focused on human trust and automation and human-computer interaction. And, you know, I'm not uh, working at YouTube. I'm trying to apply that to how do we design products that people can understand how to use, as well as how do we make, for instance, the creator products more easy to, um, to use. But <laughs> before we jump into that, before we get into our talk today on dark patterns, I wanted to introduce you guys to a recent hobby of mine. Um, so my recently new favorite hobby is uh, spotting dark patterns in GDPR compliance pop-ups. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, how, how many of you guys know what GDPR is? I'm sure everyone in here has heard of it or seen it. So just, just to remind you, in case you weren't aware of it, GDPR is the European Commission compliance um, mandate that was put out that essentially forces businesses to allow users to know where their data is being shared and then allow them to have the decision to turn it um, off or to save their data or protect their data if they don't want it being shared with advertisers or in places they don't want it. So um, this essentially forced every app and every website you've ever visited, and even now moving over here to Europe recently, um, every time I visit a new website, I get a pop-up that asks me, um, hey, uh, we are using your data, we're gonna be sharing it with people, and uh, are you okay with that? So typically these are fine and it's pretty generic, but some of them are really, really gross. So for instance, let's say you are on our website and you're browsing around and you get on and you see this pop-up. So imagine that this is a pop-up and it's saying, hey, we are going to be very transparent in all how you're, using, how you're using your data. Feel free, you as a user, you can go through and you can unclick the ones you don't want us to use and uh, you're good to go. And if you zoom in, you'll actually see there is a really, really long scroll bar and they just, it's just, it's one of those things where you're like, you, there's no way I'm gonna sit here and unclick every single one of those boxes. So of course, you as a user, you're gonna just click okay, I finished, close it, and now your data's out there being shared with, I mean, God knows how many um, <laughs> different advertisers have encountered this website. So I thought that was a really pretty egregious one. This one is one that um, I found online that I think was pretty interesting. So this one is if you, same thing, you're on your phone, you visit a site, and if you, it actually says like, hey, feel free to unclick the ones that you don't want, but if you clicked anything, unclicked anything, it would actually pop up with this processing 97%. <laughs> And it would, it would just sit there for indefinitely. And if you clicked cancel and went back and just like selected the defaults that they want you to, to do, then it would immediately go through to the website. Because, you know, that's exactly how I want um, my data being used. Or I totally trust this site now because, um, you know, they don't actually want you changing what the defaults are. Um, and this is the last one that I thought was really interesting. This one I found online. So imagine you come to the site and there's actually a timer that would come count down on the accept button as you're sitting there watching. So it's like, hey, not only am I going to sit here and make you accept this, but you know, 
It's just gonna, I'm going to put a timer on it to make you feel pressure. So I thought that was an interesting and a hard one um, to look at. But, you know, it's really easy to look at these dark patterns that are just like kind of design ones, and it's really easy to laugh at them. But there are underlying things here that actually make them very bad for our users. So before we jump into what, like, some of the psychology principles of that, I just want to, like, kind of define what dark patterns are. So what are they? Why are they bad? So according to Harry Brignall, who is the founder of darkpatterns.org, and he actually compiles a lot of these things and tries to give people ways to feel empowered to stop them, he just simply defined dark patterns as the deceptive user interface. Um, I didn't think that was actually detailed, detailed enough. There's a lot of ways that you could have an inter user interface that was quote unquote deceptive. But I think specifically for dark patterns, this is something I came up with. <laughs> and I just said, it's a design that intentionally takes advantage of human behaviors to achieve unintended actions from the user. So that's by me. <laughs> um, but essentially, the two words that I really want to focus on are intentionally taking advantage to cause unintended actions. So for instance, if we think back to this example that I showed earlier, you came to this website to do something. So you came here with something in, in, that is now being blocked by this pop-up that's coming up. So they intentionally made it really difficult for you to actually go through and unclick and actually unsubscribe from or all the different places that your uh, data is being shared so that, you could essentially, so that you could do this behavior that you didn't intend to do, which is essentially sharing your data with tons of people that you may or may not be okay with otherwise. So now Christian's going to take it from how that evolves past just design into how products can be designed dark. Right. Uh, thanks, Melissa. So as, as Melissa was suggesting, um, dark patterns uh, are an intentional usage of design that leads to an unintended consequence uh, for the user. And, and I would argue that, that this goes beyond just what uh, the user's interacting with on screen, the, the pixels that they see, but the actual mechanics uh, of the product itself. And so I kind of want to expand this to, to dark product patterns, which uh, similar to dark uh, design patterns, they take advantage of the fundamental uh, mechanics of how a product uh, delivers its value or lack thereof to the user uh, in order to uh, in either uh, to intentionally uh, potentially lead to these unintended harmful uh, consequences for for our users and so you might be thinking like that sounds terrible. What, what kind of monstrous company or product or service would do, uh, would do such a thing? Uh, and so I turn your attention uh, to this uh, very uh, cute and benign looking game. Uh, maybe this looks familiar to some of you. Uh, Farmville, has anyone heard of this game? Is it about, okay, about half, great, great, great. Okay, so uh, Farmville uh, is a very popular game around 2015 and sort of described itself to the users as a, a game about building a very successful farm. Uh, but for those of you that have played it or have spent any time reading about it, it's actually must, much less about agriculture and much more about very aggressive re-engagement tactics so that users continue to play. Uh, and Farmville actually takes uh, advantage of a whole variety of different underlying uh, behaviors and psychological principles to, uh, to keep users playing the game. So they'll use uh, notifications to bring you in, using social proofing to see what your friends are playing and motivating them to also bring you in, uh, really aggressive re-engagement tactics. And then this is all coupled with an economy of microtransactions so that that desire to get to the next level in the game that they've built up now can be easily bought for a few, a few dollars. And you might be thinking uh, that this is this is an addict. This kind of sounds like an addictive uh, gameplay. And in fact, what we've what we've seen is that uh, for a, a, some percentage of users, they're spending thousands of dollars every month just to continue playing the game. And uh, actually, if you look to the the product's own forums, you don't have to look very far to to see because players of the games themselves. This is just Farmville.com. Uh, players players asking other players. Am I addicted to Farmville? <laughs> and uh, some of them are answering. It's a little bit sad. Uh, I just wanted to call this one out. Uh, one user said, it's not an addiction. It's a full-time, part-time job. <laughs> Slanty, sad face. <laughs> uh, and so I think this is a really strong example of, of a dark product pattern. It's not necessarily something about the UI, although there might be dark patterns in the UI itself. But what we're really seeing is that there's an intentional design uh, of the product that's leading to these unintended consequences. So uh, this, this poor user here that I've obfuscated uh, probably didn't intend to take, a, take on a full-time, part-time job uh, playing 
playing Farmville, but yet here they are answering questions on the forum, letting users know that yeah, I think I'm hooked on this game. Uh, and so you might also be thinking that uh, this is more than just uh, more than just a, a, a farming game. There might be other examples of this, uh, and we want to we want to kind of expand this because it's not just about a farming game that uses microtransactions. But I would argue that actually all uh, many of these these feed based interfaces actually use very similar principles and can lead to very similar results. So we have Instagram uh, as one example but uh, also Facebook, and of course YouTube is not immune from this either, where we use very similar mechanics. We have notifications, we have an endless scroll, so you never have to leave, we always bring you more content. And, and as we're starting to learn from uh, actually academic literature, studying uh, technology, uh, technology addiction is that these same kinds of principles can lead to harmful, unintended consequences for users. And so what I was hoping to do uh, next is, is trying to understand so, what, what is the purpose of bringing users in, right? What, why, do we, why are these um, companies so motivated to, to keep users? And, and that's, it's really about uh, retention, right? It, keeping users, uh, don't leave me, stay with my product. You know, it might seem uh, on the surface that that's kind of a, a, a positive, uh, you know, if you have a very successful product that delivers value to the user, they keep coming back, it's great. But the challenge is that this is also kind of uh, intertwined with an ads-based business model. And now you have conflicting incentives where you uh, can get more revenue if your users spend more time, but now we're starting to learn that users spending more time might not always equate with a positive actual user experience. And so what I wanted to, to go into the details of here is uh, there's actually, I think, a, a very strong underlying principle uh, that uh, works for both Farmville uh, as well as these feed-based systems that can actually create these these habit-forming uh, these habit-forming loops. And to do that, uh, we'll need to dust off our Psych 101 textbooks and reintroduce ourselves to my good friend B. F. Skinner. Uh, some of you might recognize him. Uh, a fun fact about B. F. Skinner: uh, there's not that many fun facts because he's a very serious guy. <laughs> But he did actually invent uh, one of the first computerized learning systems. Uh, he felt that his daughter's education was not progressing quickly enough, so he created a mechanical arithmetic uh, teaching system so that would punish and reward based on the performance on her math problems. So, sounds like a fun dad. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it's actually kind of uh, perfectly representative of what he's much more famous for, which is uh, behaviorist, uh, the behaviorist theory uh, of learning, which is all about, uh, tries to describe human behavior as just the relationship between uh, behaviors and rewards and punishments. And so to kind of walk through this, I'm not sure if everyone is, is as familiar with, with Skinner's work. So I wanted to kind of walk through an example of how operant conditioning works and how this can be directly reflected in what we see in product design today. So uh, first off, I need to introduce you to my friend uh, Pierre. Uh, Pierre is a pigeon. Uh, Skinner liked to use pigeons a lot in his experiments, so I thought that that would be a good example. So here's Pierre, he's a handsome and happy pigeon. In an experiment, of course, he will need to be trapped in a cage, uh, in this case, an operant conditioning chamber. Uh, and in this chamber, we've got some lights. Uh, these are not for mood lighting, but they're actually sort of neutral stimuli in the environment. Uh, he's got a little lever that he can peck and then a treat uh, that comes in a tray, uh, a nice little reward uh, of pigeon food. And, <laughs> and so in the most kind of plain version of, uh, of operant conditioning, it uses a fixed reward ratio, which basically means that every time uh, Pierre uh, pecks this lever, he'll receive some food. So this light will turn on, which unbeknownst to him means that now he can peck this lever and he'll receive a nice treat. And so once he does that, uh, he makes his peck and then, mm, delicious. Oh, maybe there's something going on here. Maybe I'll, I'll try that again. Perfect, this is great, I love this. I'll keep pecking at this and I'll keep, keep getting food. But the problem is, if you want Pierre to keep pecking, uh, he's a pigeon and he might get full and might need to take a break, right? Uh, alternatively, uh, <laughs> alternatively, uh, if you stop, uh, produce, if you stop uh, providing that reward with that behavior, uh, if after he's been used to receiving it every time, Pierre will also very quickly stop pecking. So, 
If you're very interested in getting Pierre to peck as much as possible, this is actually a very bad strategy to do that. And so what, what Skinner uh, sort of uncovered was that all we have to do is just change the ratio in which we receive a reward after doing a specific behavior. And so that's actually called variable reward ratio. And all we're doing is just manipulating how often Pierre gets his treat after making uh, a pecking action. So same deal, uh, first time he, he pecks, he receives his treat and he's like, oh, well, I'm still hungry, maybe I'll try again. But second time, he gets nothing. Huh. Very frustrating, let me try again. Third time he gets nothing. Okay, well, maybe this isn't working. Ah, but here, fourth time I come through, I receive uh, a nice treat. And so, as he continues, now he stops again. But now, after only one peck, he's received his reward again. So you can see that the, the ratio, the, in, the time in between the behavior and the reward kind of varies in an unpredictable way. And what, this, uh, what Skinner uncovered is that if we use this reward ratio, basically Pierre will just peck a lot and he will do nothing, pretty much anything but, uh, or he'll, he'll do pretty much anything, uh, he'll just keep pecking uh, no matter what, uh, actually to the point of physical harm, trying to get this reward. And as you can see, this is very similar to the, the, the process that underlies a, a slot machine, where we have this sort of variable reward ratio, and then leads to these sort of harmful, ultimately for Pierre, uh, 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 these harmful behaviors. And so all we have to do to sort of translate this, we've taken a long detour into pigeon world, but let's come back to product design, uh, is just change the labels. Uh, so this red light might be something like a push notification. Uh, and then rather than pecking a lever, Pierre opens up his uh, pigeon Facebook app and receives social connection instead of a tasty pigeon treat. And under those same principles, he might open up his, his Facebook app and he receives a like, ah, I feel good, my pigeon friends really like me. Uh, and he pecks again, another like, so fantastic, I'll try again. Oh, this time, no like, instead, I get an ad. But that's okay, I'll keep pecking because hopefully I'll get a like the next time around. And so, as you can imagine, oh, next time around I get another one, and so as you can see, this is, this, is, this is that mechanism just translated. It's very simple, same basic principles. You just change around the behaviors and you change around the rewards, uh, and you can apply these same principles. And if you're looking at me thinking like, well, that is one very crazy theory as to how this all works, uh, I, would, I would argue that, uh, in fact, I'm not that crazy because in 2015, there was actually a book that was very popular in Silicon Valley that was essentially advocating using this exact uh, variable reward ratio. So this is part, uh, so this book, uh, Hooked, all about building habit-forming products, puts uh, variable reward as a central thesis to, to the, the model uh, for creating these addictive habit-forming products. So what I want to say now, and I think I could have a really um, interesting conversation with our, our previous speaker, that, that the variable reward ratio is, it, is in itself not an unethical or dangerous practice. It's a, it's a tool, it is a, it is a theory uh, of learning, uh, but it does have a high potential for misuse. Misuse in the same way that we use uh, other elements uh, of design. And uh, this is not the only example of a dark product pattern, but it is a ubiquitous one that I'm hoping now uh, there's a little bit more uh, awareness and understanding of how these things can, can function. And so this is important because as user experience designers, we design for the, entires, the entire user's experience, not just the metrics or the retention or the revenue. So if we have unhappy users that have been harmed, then we've really failed them as, uh, as designers. And so this, this means that not only the way that, you know, that designs look or how users interact and can be misled, uh, but also by the, the functions that underlie the product that can lead to these sort of harmful outcomes. But, uh, so I've kind of played the bad guy in this situation. Melissa is going to, to play the good, she'll play the angel here, <laughs> and, uh, and tell us uh, you know, why it's not all so bad and that things are, are looking up. Yeah, so, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so it's not, uh, it's not all bad. Uh, the fact that peak, uh, designers and people in the industry are becoming more aware of this, it means that we can ask questions, we can go forward, and there are things that we can do. Like, the, this is a psychology principle that we just laid out, saying like how this is something that's now being exploited, but just like psychology, you can also try and implement some, some of the uh, counteracting things to help make it more 
positive. So for instance, and this is something that our former speaker also showed up there as well, there's multiple efforts going on by different companies now to try and allow users to feel more empowered and shape their time. So for instance, YouTube is implementing a take a break feature so users can go in and they can uh, set how much time they want to spend in the app and then it will pop up and give them a notification. Hey, you said you want to take a break. That time has come feel free to do that. Um, Apple and Android are both implementing system level um, tracking um, interfaces now and software programs, so it allows you to actually see how much time you're spending in specific apps and breaks it down. It also allows you to set timers if you want. So for instance, if you are spending a lot of time in Robinhood just watching the stock market go up and down, you can actually set uh, a timer that says, hey, I'm not gonna do more than 10 minutes a day, and it will pop up and say, your time has come. And all of these are these things are allowing users to have control over their experience. And that's what it comes down to. So dark patterns exist because, again, back to that definition earlier, you're intentionally taking advantage of users' behaviors and making them do something they didn't intend to do. So now, if you're giving more control back to the user, they now will feel that they can have more control over, over that system and over their experience, and that can help, help counteract some of the negative elements of that can be built into these um, softwares and these apps and websites and such, even if they weren't intended to come out that way. So what can we do as um, the UX practitioners in the room? And I would say that we should ask questions. We are typically the one in the room who's going to be representing our users. We're going to be the ones who are designing for our users or researching with our users. And if you're sitting in a room with product managers, engineers, uh, developers, and stakeholders, people, marketers, all of these different aspects. As the UX practitioner, you're gonna be the one who has to represent the, the, the voice of the user. And being able to just ask the questions like, hey, is this a good, is this a good design? Is, are we implementing something that um, maybe in, unintentionally, you know, causing, misleading our users? You need to be the one asking that. So some of the questions are things like, are we trying to, or is this misleading users? Again, it might not be the intent. You're not going to walk up in your, into your meeting one day and you're like, I'm going to mislead some people today. That's not the, that's not the goal, hopefully. I mean, maybe. <laughs> but <laughs> no, the goal is that you want to you know, hit some metric or you know, design some products, but you want to make sure that you're not misleading the users unintentionally. Um, is this ultimately harming our users? And are we building good or bad habits? And then more importantly than anything, are we allowing our users to have control over their experience? Because that will allow them to then choose and craft the experience that they want. If someone wants to spend eight hours on YouTube, good for them. I mean, they will be an outlier in, <laughs> in our stats, statistics, and you know, good for us, or, I mean, or good for whoever. But um, if someone doesn't, and they're spending a lot of time, and they're waking up at the end of it, and they're like, what did I just do with eight hours? That's not necessarily a good thing. But if someone wants to, then it's just kind of giving them the experience that they allows them to have feel like they have control over the, the given experience. So we're here to just let the, there's no answers and there is no easy answer for this. We would love to hear um, your questions and discuss about this. This is on, an ongoing topic and you know, us coming from a psychology background, it's something that we think is ever evolving and it will be interesting to see how technology evolves as this becomes more well known. But feel free to discuss with us, we're both on Twitter and we'll be here around for the rest of the conference. So thanks. Thank <laughs> you.